I'm Gia Kokotakis, intern at Lawfare with an episode of Rational Security for June 25th, 2023. For today's episode, the team at Lawfare decided to cross-post this week's episode of Rational Security, a podcast hosted by Scott R. Anderson, Quinta Jurassic, and Alan Rosenstein, in which they cover the week's big national security news stories. Today's episode is entitled The Even Steven Edition. This week, Rosenstein, Jurassic, and Anderson were joined by Paul Steven to discuss the week's close calls in national security news, including Secretary of State Antony Blinken's meeting with President Xi Jinping in Beijing, what to do with $300 billion of frozen Russian-related assets, President Biden's attendance at a summit of AI industry leaders, and more. This is Rational Security. Scott, I, I, I am curious, how, how has, uh, what are your best colorblindness stories? Oh, there aren't any good ones. Uh, most I, memorable. Most memorable. Uh, uh, playing Settlers of Catan and people thinking I was chronically cheating uh, because I couldn't <laughs> not tell the brown pieces from the green pieces. Um, that's certainly one. Uh, cheating on Settlers of Catan is a time-honored Time-honored pastime. colorblind, tra- colorblind oh, I tradition. Didn't, I'm, I'm not even colorblind. I just went for it. Well, I actually had this amazing experience this weekend, which I highly recommend to colorblind people in the D.C. area where I went to the National Arboretum, which, as I've said on the podcast before, I'm a huge fan and booster of, and went to my favorite exhibit, which is the dwarf conifers, which I highly recommend. They're tiny, tiny little pine trees, and it's adorable, and I love them, and they're fascinating. But when I look at it, for me, it's like vibrant and all these different colors because something about like the grays and browns and greens really popped to me. And my wife was like, no, it's just a bunch of plants. It's not that interesting. Go look at some flowers if you want some colors. And I was like, maybe this is a colorblind thing. Maybe it like pops to me in different ways because I don't get the usual spectrum of beauty that other people get in that sort of environment. So if you are colorblind and have non-colorblind partners or friends, go to the National Arboretum. Let me know what you see. I want I want results. Quantitative, large end study. You know, there, there are like um, computer programs, right, where you can like drag it over a thing and it I've done it before and it is wild. Yeah. <laughs> really wild. I want to get the glasses, which is supposedly like you see people get handed these glasses and they break down in tears because they're finally seeing a fully colored world. I don't think I'm going to do that, but I'm open to it. <laughs> I will happily, if anybody wants to donate glasses, I will do it on film in case I try. And then we can do whatever you want with with the footage. Hello, everyone, and welcome to Rational Security. I am one of your regular co-hosts, Scott R. Anderson. Thrilled to be back here in the studio with one of my other regular co-hosts, Quinta Jurassic. Hello. And in the virtual studio with my other regular co-host, Alan Rosenstein. Hello, hello. And we are all thrilled to be joined by one of the original Virginia gentlemen. That may be selling a little a little too far, but uh, uh, famed and esteemed University of Virginia Law School professor and friend of ours, Paul Stephen. Paul, thank you so much for coming on the podcast today. Hello, hello, and thank you for having me. We are really excited to have you on uh, as uh, we are uh, here enjoying a, a number of stories that are trickling up in the national security ecosystem up up on the headlines that are present some difficult questions, some close issues. Uh, And so we want to talk about them with you and what we are calling in your honor, the even Stephen edition, as we split the difference between these topics. Topic one for this week. She's all that. Secretary of State Antony Blinken visited Beijing this past week for a long-delayed sit-down with President Xi Jinping to try and de-escalate the two superpowers' tense relationship. Was this meeting a smart move or a giveaway? And what should we make of President Biden calling the Chinese leader a dictator shortly after Blinken's return? Topic two, adverse repossession. Capital R, capital E, capital P, capital O, for reasons that will become evident momentarily. The question of what to do with the $300 billion in Russia-related assets frozen by the United States and its allies has reemerged, with members of Congress recently introducing a new version of the Repo Act that would seize those assets and make them available as reparations for Ukraine, among other purposes. Is seizure the right way to handle these assets? What challenges and risks might such a dramatic step encounter? And topic three, Robo Joe. President Biden joined a summit of leaders in the AI industry this week as part of his administration's ongoing effort to seriously engage the policy challenges raised by AI technology. But what are the realistic prospects for regulation and what form should they take? For our first topic, Quinta, let me hand it over to you to get us started. So longtime listeners of Rational Security may recall that um, once upon a time, Secretary of State Anthony Blinken was supposed to go to China and then there was a balloon. 
and the Chinese spy balloon uh, derailed that trip. He did De- not go. Deflated, one might it, say. Yeah, one, one might say. It turned out it was all full of hot air, but um. Sh- uh, so now he has Blinken has in fact gone to China, um, and I will say, reading the news coverage, it feels like there was a real just kaleidoscope of takes here. Um, just even reading a handful of New York Times articles, even within the space of one article, you get a take that you know this shows that the U.S. and China are trying to dial down tensions. You get a take that shows that you know this shows that. China is, you know, remaining aggressive and isn't open to any kind of cooperation. You get to take that some things were accomplished or things were not accomplished. So I will confess that after reading a bit about this, I feel like I understand it less than I did before I went in. Um, So, Scott, let me turn it over to you to start. What is your takeaway here? So I think the, the key thing to bear in mind is that we didn't see any deliverables from this product. But I'm not sure that was ever a realistic expectation. I don't think anybody should have expected Blinken to be able to walk in and say, oh, we've reached a resolution of the standoff over Taiwan. We've reached a resolution of Huawei issues. These are all longstanding issues where there's genuine points of contention between the two states in terms of their interests and uh, at least their perceived interests. And you're not going to get an easy resolution just from a couple hours meeting with Secretary of State and any world leader. That's just not how these things go. But what you did get is a mutual statement of interest in finding ways to de-escalate tensions, a statement that neither one is there to completely uh, dismantle the interests of the other. In fact, that they suggested that is not a zero-sum game between, between our two states, even if there are genuine areas of competition and conflict. And perhaps most importantly, really genuine interest in having high-level conversation on a regular basis, something that really hasn't happened much recently, um, that we saw the original effort get derailed by the balloon incident and not really get picked up, uh, kind of get stonewalled by China for a couple of months and frankly kind of maybe neglected and skipped by Blinken and other folks in the Biden administration for a few months in response to the balloon incident. As I've said on the podcast before, you know, I tend to think dialogue is a good thing and particularly perhaps even more important when you're talking about two genuine rivals But, Paul, I would actually be interested in your thoughts on this, because I know you are somebody who is a close student of the U.S.-Russia relationship during a good part of the Cold War and worked a great deal on various aspects of that relationship. How does that experience kind of inform your perspective of of this move by Blinken and the Biden administration to push open dialogue in spite of some criticism from both the opposing party and members of their own party of, uh, you know, being too willing to engage with this dialogue? dialogue, you know, a giveaway to uh, a potentially hostile China, or is it uh, an important tool in the diplomatic toolkit? Scott, I uh, think that it's specific to who you're talking to. I I think with Russia, particularly in the Soviet days, uh, there was a tendency to be perceived as weak unless you made it clear that you had boundaries that you kept on setting. Uh, So even though I was uh, for a while running something called the Forum for U.S.-Soviet Dialogue at the NGO level, we still had to be clear that dialogue for dialogue's uh, sake was not our thing. Uh, And we got respected much more by our uh, interlocutors when we made that clear. I thought your take back in the balloon days was right on, I, I think, with China, given our deep interdependency that we need to be talking to each other. And there's a way to do that without seeming naive or vulnerable. I I felt as I I think maybe you did at the time that we made too much of the balloon episode, that it uh, was kind of silly and that our reaction was kind of silly. I know others disagreed with that, but I I, I framed this meeting with uh, Blinken and the Chinese leadership the same way. I don't see how it can hurt. And and I don't see the Blinken said anything that hurt us. Well, I think, Paul, you and I represent the pinstripe pants wearing uh, State Department associated contingent of Washington, perhaps, uh, on these issues, for better or for worse. Alan, I, I know you had some different instincts, or at least were willing to voice some different instincts, if maybe didn't reflect it. Do you, do you have a kind of a different sense about where the boundary about how to do dialogue and how not to do it is around this particular relationship? I, I mean... I, I think I'm generally in agreement with with you pinstripe folks that, you know, talking is generally a good thing uh, and that if you're not going to talk, you should always plan to talk at some point 
uh, later. So this all this all seems quite reasonable to me. And one of the things that I found really interesting about this reporting was just how different the perceptions of these visits have been inside China and outside China. <clears throat> Where outside China, it's kind of like a you know, nothing too interesting. It's good that you know the two great superpowers are talking. Um, you know, we'll see what happens. Whereas in China, this is being spun as a sort of humiliation for the United States, who come begging hat in hand for a conversation and. You know, they. I, I think there was there was one article which pointed out that in China they've noticed that uh, Blinken came on Father's Day, which I guess makes Xi Jinping the U.S.'s daddy. Which is, I will say, I actually <laughs> thought that was kind of funny. Interesting. It's a little, spin. it's a little funny. Uh, I, I think it's very lie. funny. But but I I just I think um, you know, I I I think that's you know as as unpleasant as it is to you know think that some other group of people thinks that your country's lame. I think that's totally fine, right? I mean, these things always play out differently for domestic than in foreign audiences and. You know, even if Xi Jinping is, as President Biden pointed out, a dictator, uh, even dictators have to be quite sensitive on some margins to public opinion. Um, you know, the, the thing that I'm hoping for is just that, you know, Republicans and, and China hawks don't um, uh, don't make too much of the fact that uh, uh, the U.S. is being you know, slapped around in, in Chinese media. That's fine. Right. If, if that's the price that uh, we have to pay for uh, a good, sustainable dialogue with with China, um, that's a, a certainly a price worth uh, paying. Yeah, I would just throw in that uh, my impressions of China is that there is a substantial nationalist, uh, what we would call right wing uh, sentiment in the country. And it's something that the leadership has to take care of, uh, that uh, there is a whole segment of the country that is not prospering the way that the people we tend to interact with uh, are doing, and that uh, the leadership actually stays up worrying about those folks. And that some of what we see in the Chinese press is reflecting that. It, it may not be a complete democracy, but it's not a one-way totalitarian system either. I, I will say I want to recommend a piece that's actually relevant to this that I did not get a chance to share with you all. Apologies, because I found it literally like 10 minutes before I walked into the studio. Um, but our Brookings Institution colleague, Patricia Kim, actually just this morning, this Wednesday, June 21st for recording, published a piece on the order from Chaos Blog, one of the, the uh, publications that Brookings runs, uh, particularly our foreign policy program, that breaks down some of the Chinese readouts of the meeting, uh, I think, on the reflection that they are a useful way to gauge the domestic way that both Xi Jinping and his fellows in the government there are framing this and then how it's being perceived by those domestic political audiences. And one of the big takeaways she thinks is interesting, which I think is really, really important here, is that the one thing they hit on is that there's a real openness to continued dialogue. You know, while this was in some ways framing Xi as a great statesman and being very kind of puff, a lot of puffery associate that one might associate with a very person-centric, uh, personality-centric regime in a kind of more autocratic system like China does have. I don't think anyone's going to argue with that. You know, it really drove home the point that there actually is reason to have these meetings, to have these discussions. And that itself is interesting because, as as you know, Paul and, and Alan, as you alluded to, like that there are parts of the domestic, you know, constituency in China – Xi could lean into um, that would be more hostile to these sorts of dialogue efforts. And instead, he seems to be framing himself, framing himself saying, no, I am in the camp that says we should keep talking. And domestically, I think that raises uh, – there's a similar dynamic going on with the Biden administration to some extent um, where there is a strong instinct for people to say, no, we don't want dialogue. Uh, but, you know, it takes some degree of po domestic political risk to keep open these lines of communication. I think that was, for me at least, that was my big reservation with the handling of the balloon incident. It seemed to be giving in to domestic political fear at the expense of what is a very useful diplomatic tool, which is high-level conversation. And hopefully this is a sign, at least in my view, the Biden administration may be willing to eat some of those domestic political costs to say, no, we're going to keep these channels open. And there are signs that that the Xi Jinping government may be willing to do the same. That's That's a good thing all around, I would say. So one of the issues that there was not progress on reportedly was that uh, Lincoln wasn't able to secure the reopening of military to military communications between the U.S. and China, uh, which China had shut down um, in protest after Nancy Pelosi, who was then the Speaker of the House, visited Taiwan in August 2022. Um, and Blinken said uh, that this was an issue we have to keep working on. Um, so I'm curious for your all's thoughts about that, how that fits into the picture that we've just been discussing. Well, I, I think that military dialogue is a really good thing, certainly in uh, the uh, 
80s with the Soviets, it was one of the areas that we found it easy to make progress. And it was feel good on both sides because the military always liked to be, you know, a leg up on their uh, uh, domestic uh, peer adversaries, uh, the State Department and Ministry of Foreign Affairs. And, and I think cutting this off, as they did, shows exactly how serious they are about Taiwan. You know, the, the good news is as passions as high as they are about Taiwan, we still haven't blown things up. And, and that's good. I think Blinken made that point. But uh, it, I think there is a real asymmetry in people's sensitivity and perceptions and and there's more risk in that part of the relationship than anything else. Uh, so I, I hope we get back to a point where the military are talking to each other. I suspect both sides, both chiefs of staff would like to be doing that and hope they can bring their political leadership on board. Yeah. You know, this this role of these deconfliction lines, I think is like I think I've actually met this on the podcast before. It's a wildly understudied and underappreciated in their significance new type of diplomatic dialogue, one that like begs for some sort of closer examination from both an international legal perspective and a um, policy perspective. Because there are environments, Syria being the leading example, where it has been a major, major priority because it is keeps two militaries that are operating in close proximity to each other and that are hostile but don't want to move or potentially at least competitors but don't want to move into open hostilities from – allows them to de-conflict their operations, prevent a case where you have planes running into each other or perceiving one of each other as a threat or other sort of military action. And in Syria, that proved really, really important as a way of keeping from escalating tensions with Russia. And in occasional cases you know, where you had, for example, uh, the Wagner Group um, launching attacks on positions held by U.S. allied forces, uh, primarily Kurdish forces, the Syrian Democratic Forces – as they're known, you know, you actually it actually also helped notify that because these were not actions being deconflicted through deconfliction lines. And at a certain point, the United States became more comfortable saying, "Well, the Russians aren't owning this, so maybe we can shoot back at it um, without worth risking escalating with Russia." I will say, my understanding of U.S. military operations in the Taiwan space, in particular, which I think is the main area where you would be worried about inadvertent escalation is a little different. There certainly are operating in relative close proximity, although the strait is much bigger than, um, you know, some of the dividing lines like that were that were being fought across in um, Syria and certain other environments. But interestingly, like the United States, actually a lot of the things it does in closest proximity to China are done very openly and kind of provocatively, deliberately, like freedom of navigation operations. So you're sending naval forces through the Taiwan Strait, but you're doing it notoriously. You're trying to do it as publicly as possible to show to China and show to the world you can interfere with navigation straits here, right, or navigation rights. Um, you know, you've got to respect those. Uh, there are spy planes that fly, you know, supposed to fly very close to the border of China, but not cross out of international waters. Again, the United States doesn't, I don't think, make much of an effort to hide that it's actually doing that. Um, it's more that's relying on international law to be able to keep pursuing those activities. And so I'm not sure it's as important there in a day-to-day operational context. I think what they're really worried about is that you know if you were to hit a point of heightened tension or an inadvertent incident, it would be harder to deconflict from it without those military to military lines of communication open. Remember, Mark Milley called his Chinese counterparts towards the end of the Trump administration in an effort to you know, thwart down perceived risks of escalation there. And that's the channel that's absent. I will say having high level diplomatic channels can serve as a substitute for those emergency moments, you know, the red phone line, Cuban missile crisis sorts of situations. Um, So there might be that might be a, a bit of a substitute in the worst case scenarios, but a working level channel that can be used more regularly will inevitably help both states stay on the right side of the line and avoid inadvertent escalation. Um, and, and I agree. Hopefully they're working in that direction. And, and it seems like there's at least openness to that possibility, if not quite yet. I mean, going back to my uh, the start of my career, we had that channel and it was called Henry Kissinger. And he was not willing <laughs> right. to let anyone else share. I, I, I think having specific groups, whether it's the intelligence community or the military or, or the uh, ministries of foreign affairs talking to each other, without going through a big guy, uh, as Kissinger was uh, with Nixon and Ford, is a better approach. Paul, are you, are you saying you don't want to call Henry out of retirement for one, He's last, available. Uh, one last round? He is available. 
Yeah, he yeah. will outlive us all. He's got to burn off the calories from all those birthday cakes he's eaten the other day. I feel like yeah. every photo I saw with him was with a different birthday cake for like two weeks. Yeah, my, my son was like that at his second birthday, and Henry <laughs> seems to be doing the same for his 100th. <laughs> uh, fair enough. So b- before we close this topic out, I, I do want to spend a few minutes on the latest Uncle Joe moment. Though, who knows? Was it an Uncle Joe moment when uh, Joe Biden called Xi Jinping a, a dictator? This was in the context of talking about the balloon and Biden saying that he thought that the Chinese were quite embarrassed by this balloon, which was a Chinese spy balloon, but pretty clearly only sort of accidentally entered U.S. airspace. And he was saying that, you know, like any dictator, Xi Jinping is embarrassed when uh, stuff like this goes wrong. And the Chinese are very, very displeased um, in in, you know, just as, as you would expect a dictatorship to be. So, so let me ask you, Scott, I mean, uh, like, like I said, is this a, is this a whoops, Uncle Joe moment? Or, or do you think this was, uh, this was intentional to, 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 you know, echo the, the West Wing? Did, did Joe Biden see that the red light was on? You know, I think we've seen a pattern in this administration, um, particularly, frankly, after its first year um, where China's where it's become kind of more focused on China or it's taking a good cop, bad cop sort of strategy internally. Um, That's often a relationship played between the executive and Congress. Uh, not always in ways executive likes. Often it's like a very real one's a good cop, one's a bad cop from a China engagement perspective. And that's still a live dynamic. But now there's a an added element of it within the executive branch because we've seen President Biden go beyond what his, you know, bureaucratic staff and political advisors and even the secretary of state are willing to do in regards to defining U.S. policy. There's a pretty well carefully calibrated U.S. policy around Taiwan, and a lot of Chinese issues. And President Biden, which says essentially the United States doesn't actually commit to come to Taiwan's defense. It hasn't since the 1970s. It says we just we don't like any sort of proposals to interrupt the status quo absent negotiation between these two parties, any use of force is wrong. We also, as President, as Blinken got in trouble for re- reiterating uh, during the meeting this week, the official State Department position is also we don't support independence for Taiwan, nor do we support movements towards independence by Taiwan unilaterally. We only support them in the context of negotiations with mainland China. And that became a little bit of a point of controversy, but it's been the U.S. position for 30 years, uh, if not longer. But we see Biden moving a little past that. He's a little more friendly in his rhetoric towards Taiwan. He is willing to say, we're going to come to the defense of Taiwan, only to have his staffers roll that back, as we've talked about a few times previously on the podcast. I don't think that's a mistake. I don't think those are Joeisms. I think it's a deliberate strategy. I think it has domestic political elements because that's a position that probably sells a little better in domestic audiences, particularly among kind of pro-Taiwan contingencies within the Democratic Party and with Congress in both parties. But I also think there might be a geostrategic element. It's useful for him to look like he's harder on China. And I think that's why you see Blinken being the main interlocutor here. Um, you know, Biden didn't go to China. Blinken did. That's a big deal. And it'll be interesting to see what happens if they send the foreign minister to Washington, D.C., whether he meets with Biden. I suspect Biden will meet with them. But it might be a short meeting, not not a super long multi-day or multi-hour sort of engagement as it is in this case. But I do think that, that that's the kind of their tack right now. They, they need to look like they're willing to be bad cops. And that gives China an incentive to say, well, we need to actually give a little bit in our engagement with the Biden administration. Paul, does that sound right to you? And, and do you see any – I'm tr- curious from the Russia context whether you saw a similar dynamic in, among different administrations that – about w- different ways different actors engage with the same regime. Well, people certainly walked around eggs when President Reagan would go off. And there was a perception that he said some things that were unscripted and perhaps unfortunate. And and with the Soviets, I think much more so than with Putin, uh, they were very careful to have their mad dog separated from their leadership. Their leadership were as gray as possible and never said anything uh, interesting, much less inflammatory, uh, although they had plenty of people on the edges. Uh, and And... Not only Reagan, but I, I, I think American presidents who face a different kind of political accountability have to play to our masses, to our audiences, and, and say some things that, you know, from a diplomatic perspective, you wish they wouldn't say. And, and I think that's quite a legitimate process. I don't think it is a sign that Biden, you know, doesn't know what he's doing. So I, I'm agreeing with you, Scott. That's what I like to hear. That's, a, that's why we have this podcast. <laughs> No, no, that's why we that's why we invite guests onto this podcast because certainly Quint and I are not going to give them the satisfaction. Exactly. And it will give me the damn satisfaction. Exactly. <laughs> so moving from trying to be nice to one dictatorship to 
not being nice to another dictatorship. Let's talk about Russia and the issue of Russia assets. So folks may recall that one of the uh, really dramatic steps that the U.S. and the sort of broad international community took after Russia invaded Ukraine a year ago was to freeze Russian assets, including uh, Russia's central bank assets held in the United States. This is hundreds of billions of dollars of, uh, uh, you know, really uh, important uh, uh, reserves for Russia. And ever since then, there's been this question of, well, what should we do with these assets? And very quickly, folks started suggesting, well, why don't we just use these to help Ukraine? Particularly when this war is over, um, Ukraine will need you know, a Marshall Plan of sorts. It'll need hundreds of billions of dollars at least to rebuild. And wouldn't it be great if uh, we could just use this these Russian assets, given that Russia has you know flagrantly violated every international law uh, on uh, the books? Recently, uh, earlier this month, two senators on the Foreign Relations Committee, Jim Risch, who's a Republican from Idaho, and uh, Sheldon Whitehouse, who's a Democrat from Rhode Island, introduced uh, legislation, which they're calling the Rebuilding Economic Prosperity and Opportunity for Ukrainians Act. Uh, Careful listeners will notice that Rebuilding Economic Prosperity and Opportunity is repo, uh, hence adverse repossession in Scott's clever introduction. You see, it all comes full circle on the show. Uh, and, and that that's would, the sort of explanation I like to get for my puns. Thank you, Alex. Yeah, no, you <laughs> have to go. You, you have it. to go. You have to go deep. It's funnier if you explain it. That's what I found with jokes generally. Uh, it, it, and th- this would uh, basically authorize the, the use of these frozen central bank assets to help the Ukrainians. You know, Scott, both Scott and Paul, you you've written stuff for Lawfare uh, about sort of generally this question of using Russian assets. Um, I think I want to start with with you, Paul. Um, I think it may be helpful to sort of divide the issue into three parts, right? There's the uh, domestic legal question of how to do this and whether you can do this. There's the international legal question of whether you can do this. And, and then there's all the policy questions of whether one should do this. So I, I think it may be helpful to kind of split them out. And we just start with the domestic legal question. So Paul, will you will you just give an overview of what it takes to use these sorts of assets, whether it's legal under US law, and what role, if any, this legislation or legislation like it were to pass, how would that affect the domestic legal uh, situation? Well, first, I want to note that Repo Man was one of the great films of the 1980s, I think right up there with Buckaroo Banzai, and 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 so we have to honor the, the uh, Congress for uh, quoting the great film. Uh, legally, uh, there's a handful of people who, with whom I strongly disagree, who thinks the president already has the authority to confiscate frozen assets. I think the, and I think most people think uh, the record's pretty clear uh, that since 1977, I guess it was, uh, we've drawn a line between the kind of sanctions that you use in an armed conflict and the kind of sanctions you use outside of armed conflicts and that the president doesn't have the authority or hasn't been given by Congress the authority to uh, confiscate assets that he is allowed to freeze. Uh, And I, I think the reason this legislation keeps on coming up is a recognition that the president cannot do this without Uh, further authority. There are a a few exceptions. Uh, For example, uh, if the uh, UN Security Council uh, requires uh, the transfer of assets to a UN facility, there's a decent argument under the uh, US membership of the uh, UN that the president has collateral authority to do that. Um, And in armed conflict situations where we are a party, as we're not in Ukraine, we probably have that authority. But uh, so point one is uh, this legislation is necessary to move from freezing to confiscation as a matter of domestic law. Very few people dispute that, although some do. I think that's right, Paul. You know, there there is an argument made by by a certain folks. Larry Tribe has made the argument most notably, uh, both in the New York Times and Wall Street Journal about that statutory argument. But I think it's fair to say that's not a mainstream argument. Um, I think most people would say it's actually pretty clearly established. Existing legal authorities don't reach divesting or seizing assets. There is this question, though, now, say this law is enacted. How do we actually square this or can we actually square this with 
constitutional requirements because we have here in the United States more so even than other countries, although many other countries have similar domestic legal doctrines. It obviously varies country to country, constitution to constitution. But we have traditional protections both of property rights from a due process perspective and then, of course, we have the takings clause, which guarantees – people compensation um, for uh, these sorts of claims. You know, I, I, a lot of people try and get around this by saying, well, foreign governments, it's not clear they have constitutional rights. Um, there is a, a, a hint by the Supreme Court that in a case, Argentina v. Weltover, um, where they alluded to the fact that, well, doesn't it make sense that foreign governments don't have due process rights because we don't let the governments of the 50 states have due process rights? And two appellate courts have followed that logic and held that they don't have due process rights. But, uh, you know, that's not a resolved legal issue. And perhaps more importantly here, most of these assets aren't actually alleged to have been owned by just the Russian government outright, like the Ministry of Defense or anything like that. They're owned by the central bank, which is a substantially autonomous. I mean, they, you can do the tests, but the bar is pretty high to determine that, you know, an institution like the central bank is an alter ego of the government and uh, institutions. And those sorts of state-owned enterprises where they are substantially independent – you usually get treated as having international legal personality like a corporation, and corporations do – can exercise due process rights and takings clause claims. Uh, not to mention that uh, other – a lot of the other frozen assets are actually owned by individuals, <laughs> individual persons who certainly can claim those rights. Yes, often these are foreign nationals, but if they have sufficient ties to the United States like owning property here, such as the type that's under seizure here, then they usually are able to claim some degree of those rights. Um, and I think the same logic – kind of applies to takings clause issues too. There's a big, well-established exception in U.S. constitutional law for takings in the context of wartime. Uh, and that's informed by the uh, constitutional provision that gives Congress the authority to determine the seizure of land and water seizures um, during armed conflict. It's been around. So there's a Supreme Court case, Brown v. something, I can't recall now, in 1812, where Chief Justice Marshall actually said, yeah, well, this basically gives Congress the authority to figure out what we do with property seized during wartime. And it's up to Congress to, to legislate that. Outside of wartime, though, it's tricky. That's always been seen as the exception to takings clause requirements and and due process requirements to some extent. Um, and even in wartime, the Supreme Court has made pretty clear there are due process requirements to at least make sure that, like, the assets in question are actually owned by a national of an enemy government or the enemy government itself. So it raises just a lot of really novel questions that we haven't seen the courts wrestle with. And the reason we haven't seen the courts wrestle with it is because the U.S. government has never – done it, to my knowledge. They've never actually seized foreign government property outside of wartime. There was one legislative effort proposal uh, and related statute that gave authority to do it for a year in the 60s uh, regarding Cuban assets um, that was repealed by uh, at the urging of the Johnson administration because they said it would undermine our global efforts to respect property rights, uh, anti-expropriation um, efforts, particularly in relation to communist governments. And so as far as I know, it was never used. TWI aspects of the Trading with the Enemies Act, which also had a vesting provision, were used af at, out of the context of wartime or in relation to other sorts of property. But the case that it was actually used to vest a lot of that property, particularly for people who weren't party to a conflict at some, at some point, pretty low. I haven't been able to find much historical practice that actually suggests that's there. And notably, a lot of the property that was seized – from even enemy states under TWIA actually was returned eventually, interestingly. Not all of it, but a lot of it was. Um, same is true. Uh, the United States did seize the assets of Iraq after the invasion in 2003. Um, but you spent a lot of them on reconstruction, query whether that's the appropriate way to handle it or not, given that, um, you know, even at that point, I'm not even sure we'd establish ourselves as occupying authorities. But regardless, did eventually transfer kind of the lion's share of it back to the new Iraqi government. So, you know, I have a lot of reservations about seizure uh, in this case from a domestic legal perspective that I don't think are fully appreciated or usually very adequately responded to by folks. doesn't mean that I don't sympathize with the goal. And I actually think we can talk about this. There are other ways that might be able to do basically the same thing that don't trigger these same legal concerns. But the seizure mechanism, which is at the heart of the Repo Act, I still have a lot of heartburn with. And that's before we even get into international law, um, which, Paul, I know you've written about in, in this particular area. Yeah, so one point quickly, both last year's bill, uh, which Senator Whitehouse, UVA grad, I quickly add, uh, was uh, one of the big sponsors of, and the new bill have a no judicial review for states, including state-owned enterprises. I think, A, that's probably legally wrong, but also I, th I don't get it. Um, I, 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 if you believe that Congress has pretty clear constitutional authority to uh, mandate 
forfeiture of assets. It doesn't have to be in a war because we don't have wars after the UN Charter, but we have contexts where the Supreme Court are willing to uh, acknowledge congressional power. Then judicial review is simply, is the executive branch doing what the statute says? And I think these ought to be easy cases. They shouldn't slow the process down. And and so I, I think the no judicial review provisions are a self-inflicted wound, uh, just unnecessary. Now, as the international law part, you know, it's easy if you have the Security Council on your side, as we did with Iraq, or if you have a deal, as we did with Iran and the hostage crisis. Uh, what's hard is if you're not going to get Security Council support, but you use the funds for a process that seems pretty clearly legitimate under international law. And uh, I think uh, the duty to provide reparations to Ukraine is exactly something that's clear. And I think these funds can be held as earnest money against uh, reparations. Uh, I don't think you can really talk about reparations until you end the process of creating new damages, which is to say you need a ceasefire before you can realistically think about uh, reparations. And I think you need a process that ensures that the money will only be used for reparations and not for things uh, that will benefit Ukraine, but also benefit the United States. This is where I disagree with both Senate bills because they fund explicitly in the case of last year's bill and imp- implicitly in the case of the new one, very much what uh, people like Tribe and uh, uh, Zelico have argued for, pay for uh, Ukrainian weapons with uh, Russian assets. I, I, I appreciate the moral symmetry and deliciousness of that, but I think that's problematic under international law. Paying somebody to fight, especially when you yourself are not a party to that conflict, is just different from holding money in earnest against reparations uh, under international law. So I, I would like to see a mechanism that uh, dedicates the money clearly through a confiscation process, but so the money can only be spent in some kind of internationally supervised way that ensures that it will be used only for reparations and not for other purposes. I guess my question is why you both think this idea has been so persistent. As we mentioned at the beginning, it's this is legislation that's been introduced now multiple times. The proposal has been floating around for a while. Um, if I'm remembering correctly, almost since the beginning of the Ukraine war, at least a few months after the the war began. Um, Scott, I think you were saying that this isn't something that has really been tried before. Um, so what accounts for the the popularity? Is it just kind of that the U.S. is in some ways necessarily on the sidelines in this conflict and Congress is kind of looking for ways to step in? Paul, I'm curious for your thoughts. Well, I think what makes this case a bit different is uh, we don't usually get central bank funds involved. And when you have central bank funds, first of all, it's not just the U.S. I think there's a lot more central bank money uh, outside the U.S., particularly in the EU. Uh, But, you know, if you count our allies, the people who are willing to sanction, uh, it comes to a lot of money. We have to go back, I think, to Iran to really see a comparable situation where the Shah was so willing to uh, bank so many assets in U.S. institutions that gave us something to play with. And I think there's a natural instinct when we have a, a conflict that we feel very strongly about. The uh, morality and legality in Iran was very clear and one-sided. We feel very clear about Ukraine, uh, even if we aren't actually a party to that conflict in the technical sense. We want to do something. We want to play with the toys we have. And, and these uh, funds are within our grasp. Uh, so any arguments against the, I, I think I've before I've talked about it in terms of junk food, you know, it just tastes so good uh, and feels so good to do it. And, and, and yet, you know, especially us aging people, we aware too much junk food over time isn't good for you. And, <laughs> and, uh, and I think it's true here as well, but it's hard to be the voice of restraint given that, you know, the overwhelming case for Ukraine is so strong. 
And and I do think, you know, it reflects a frustration that I think other people have felt with the international legal system for decades. And that is now really being driven home for a lot of people who are engaged that much with international legal processes and rights, which is that the international legal system is ripe with uh, you know, valid claims without a remedy. There's no clear institutional process by which, um, frankly, it's clear that you would get a judgment for in Ukraine's behalf, but on jurisdictional reasons, not because of the merits. Everyone agrees the merits are clearly in Ukraine's favor. We got to figure out exactly what the amount of damage is. There may be counterclaims that Russia could make in certain cases, although not nearly anything with remotely at the scale that Ukraine could make. It's kind of complicated technical accounting questions, but no one doubts Ukraine would be owed reparations under the substantive law of international law. But it's not clear what body has jurisdiction to do that. You know, the ICJ has some, uh, you know, jurisdiction it's exercising, but it's over this very unique kind of novel jurisdictional claim related to genocide convention that's not clear would actually result, frankly, seems fairly unlikely to result in substantial reparations awards based on prior ICJ judgments under the genocide convention. ICC doesn't really give kind of scale reparations for the types of claims you would expect. No other body has that kind of scope. And then even if you did get an international judgment, it's not clear how you would enforce it because, you know, ICJ awards, usually if they get paid off, it's because it's voluntary, a result of diplomatic pressure. There's no automatic enforcement. And it's not clear diplomatic pressure is going to pressure the Putin government into paying this money or that's going to do so voluntarily. So you've got to be a little more coercive. I'm not sure evolution in the law, international law particularly, is necessarily even unwarranted here. Um, you know, I think you can advance a kind of novel vision of countermeasures, a, a, a kind of uh, system that allows for certain conduct that would otherwise be unlawful as a means of pressuring another state to restore its lawful behavior, to come back into compliance with their national legal obligations. You could frame ways to to fit some sort of manner of compensation, particularly once you get those international judgments to Ukraine, I think, under a lot of these countermeasures frameworks. But they're going to be novel. It's going to be a development. It's a change from the way it's usually been done in the past and so requires careful consideration and broad international consensus. And I think that's another issue that's really been lost on on people here as well is that despite the international um, consensus around th- these issues and the focus on the U.S. legislation, it's actually pretty unlikely the United States actually is the one who has most of these assets. It has substantial assets. But the vast majority are believed to be held in European central banks. Um, and that makes a lot more sense given Russia's you know, relationship with the United States since particularly since 2014, uh, given that it was trying to insulate itself from U.S. sanctions. So you know, while we don't have the exact accounting, I think that's likely true. And that means this has to be a multilateral solution. It has to be one that multiple states are comfortable with, both from international law and their domestic law and policy perspectives. And that's just a hard thing to negotiate. I think it's good to be negotiating it. But anybody who comes in and says, oh, this is the one thing the U.S. Congress is going to do is going to fix this problem, I think is not appreciating the scale of the problem. Yeah, just to follow up on that, Scott, with the Europeans. First of all, the Europeans are just now talking about doing something that we did with the Budget Act at uh, the start of uh, 2023, which is to dedicate civil forfeiture money, including sanctions evasion money, to the Ukrainians. Uh, but that doesn't create any new authority to seize. It just uh, is a disbursement authority. So the Europeans haven't even caught up with us on that. And and the um, amount of money involved is uh, chicken feed. There's nothing really in that. Uh, the real money is in the central bank deposits. And the Europeans face much higher hurdles than we do. Uh, they have to get past the uh, Court of Justice of the European Union where you have a sort of it's international law, but it's also European law and and uh, very hard to amend. And I think the Court of Justice of the European Union has already uh, staked out a much tougher position about the, uh, the legal hoops you have to go through before you can confiscate. Unless we are sure we're uh, in step with our allies, I, I think we proceed at our peril. That's why I like the solution of you know, creating a structure that holds the money in earnest uh, against future reparations and to do it with the Europeans and, of course, Australia, Canada, New Zealand, uh, Japan as well. Because I, I think we avoid that problem if we proceed in that direction. But that's exactly what repo doesn't do. Repo envisions that as a possibility, but the real authority is unilaterally in the Secretary of State. 
uh, to spend the money as that uh, as the secretary thinks is appropriate. Well, let's move from uh, debating the intelligence of certain proposals to debating artificial intelligence as a whole, uh, because we have seen a, an interesting development this last week, kind of a motion in a direction that we don't see the president take that often. It's not unprecedented, but um, President Biden traveled to the West Coast and sat down with the leaders of the artificial intelligence industry, uh, which I think is now very well established as a very important industry in a way that probably was not, to most people's knowledge, a year ago, and gave a couple of remarks, while the remarks actually were fairly broad and not particularly useful in general and brief, um, but nonetheless engaged with them with a pretty extended conversation about the virtues of AI, the dangers and risks of AI, the concerns it face, it presents, and really made a very demonstrated, fairly high profile, got a lot of media coverage, um, show of saying, I am directly engaged and my administration is directly engaged on this debate, um, which has really kind of catapulted itself to the front pages of newspapers in um, the past few weeks. And it's particularly noticeable because it really elevated an office that I think was established by the Obama administration in the White House. I could be wrong, but I believe that's right. The Office of Science and Technology Policy, OSTP, and has really kind of put it at the forefront of some of the more significant policy questions we're seeing in the technology and society, technology and national security, but also broader society space uh, and, and is really having it play a role in developing some broad guidelines, including a, a blueprint for AI governance that the White House rolled out a few months ago um, that uh, you could see echoes of in the debate taking place. Uh, although I think there are already also already signs that the Biden administration may be trying to move past to some new proposal or new sorts of engagement and action that that builds on that further. Alan, I think you're probably the one of us who's who spent the most time closely tracking uh, how uh, – thinking about how the administration could engage us, looking at how they are engaging this. Tell us a little about what you see. And then, Paul, I want to come to you actually because I know you've written a really uh, insightful book that touches on some of these issues to some extent and, and talk to you a little bit about how this fits in kind of the international regulatory context. Um, but, Alan, let me start with you on kind of the, the domestic and the more ground level. W- where does this fit in with what the Biden administration is trying to do? Look, I I think the Biden administration is probably doing the best that any administration can in terms of trying to get its arms around, you know, AI generally and generative AI and large language models and all of that more specifically, which is is the technology behind things like ChatGPT. You know, to to me, I think what this shows is the limits, and I just mean that descriptively, not necessarily normatively, the limits of trying to regulate emerging technology when that technology is being developed entirely in the private sector. So, you know, I think one thing that's really interesting is to compare the the development of of AI, this generation of AI in particular, machine learning and that sort of stuff, to the development of the internet in the 1970s and 80s. You know, I think at this point, most people know that the internet started as a, a kind of defense department research project, trying basically to uh, create a resilient communications network uh, that could survive a, you know, a nuclear assault from the Soviets. Uh, and, and that's what led to the sort of magic of the uh, decentralized uh, internet. Now, it, it became very clear uh, that the internet was going to have commercial applications far exceeding any defense applications. And the government... Uh, in the 80s, and especially in the 90s under the Clinton administration, when this stuff really started heating up, understood that and, and did not want to, to stop that. Um, but they were also able to, because of their initial early involvement, to actually control quite a bit of the internet's early development. So, you know, a lot of the, or the early internet was done as a, basically a contract between the Commerce Department and um, what later became uh, ICANN, the, the international body that, that sets basic internet fundamentals like IP addresses and and things of that nature. And and again, although the government never tried too hard to control the development of the internet, it it did because of this relationship, you know, because for a while the internet was like the entire global internet was kind of run by the commerce department in some technical sense. Um, They were able to, uh, you know, certainly understand, I think the internet sort of quite well, and they could have intervened if, if they wanted to. Now, compare this to today when the government has essentially no role in the development of AI or machine learning. I mean, honestly, the only role they really have is in that 
you know, through things like the National Science Foundation, I guess they probably fund some basic research in computer science departments. Uh, but honestly, even academia hasn't had like that big of a role. I mean, most of the stuff was basically invented by the big tech companies. You know, to take an example, the, the T in GPT, which is, stands for transformer, particular kind of architecture that allows large language models to provide uh, sort of more useful results as, as the, the queries uh, get more complicated. That was just sort of invented by Google researchers, even though the government you know, could have a big role to play because these training runs are so expensive and you know, the government obviously has deep pockets. It turns out that private industry has, you know, been more than capable of funding, uh, you know, itself, right? Uh, you know, chat, uh, OpenAI, which created ChatGPT, has Microsoft backing and then Google's doing its own thing and Facebook doing its own thing and so forth and so on. So just based on how the government is positioned with respect to these this new technology, there's just not a lot of entry points for regulation. Now, look, at the end of the day, you know, uh, the, the the U.S. government still has a monopoly on the use of legitimate force in the United States. Um, so, like, it, it could regulate AI. Um, you know, there's nothing stopping it. Um, you know, Congress could pass a comprehensive uh, a regulatory system. Um, you know, the FTC could do what it wants to do, so forth, and, and, and you know, so on and so forth. But that, of course, takes time. It's very hard to do. Um, Congress is quite sclerotic. This technology is new. It's vast. It, you know, it's it's the the upside potential is huge. The downside potential is huge, and and you know, because um, because of that, the inertia is just for this technology to develop very, very quickly. And so I'm just skeptical that the government is frankly going to be able to meaningfully shape its development. Now, th that, that's a descriptive claim. That's separate than, from the normative claim of is that good or is that not? I don't know, right? Uh, you know, I'm, I'm neither a naive AI booster, nor am I a, a AI doomer. You know, I really think this has immense upside potential and also immense downside potential. And it's just not clear to me whether government involvement would sufficiently tamp down on the downside potential to outweigh the possible decrease in innovation that might decrease the upside potential. Um, so, you know, we can argue about the, the sort of normative questions, you know, but I, I do think the, the fact that really there's, there's, there's not going to be any AI regulation in Congress anytime soon. Certainly nothing very meaningful. I, you know, I think it's going to be very hard for even the executive branch agencies to do anything. I think the best that the Biden administration can do is things like, you know, AI bills of rights and have NIST, the, the, the technical standard setting body in the Commerce Department, release, you know, suggested risk frameworks and, and to do just like basic, I'm not sure you'd call this soft law, but have the president go to Silicon Valley, right? As, as he did, uh, you know, yesterday, we're recording this on Wednesday, so he did it on Tuesday, uh, and meet with you know, leaders in, in AI and, and leaders in the tech and policy and sort of ethics space uh, uh, around that. And that's better than nothing. But it, it, it's just, uh, I, again, I think it's just dramatic how, how little the government is involved in what, you know, could be, as many people and many sober minded people think, the biggest invention since the printing press. I will, I will say, Ellen, I'm actually, interestingly, I feel like I, I disagree with you on this insofar as I, I've actually you, been You struck... always disagree with me. What's no, interesting no, no, no. about I that? <laughs> <laughs> I disagree with you in that I'm, I'm going to stick up for the government here. Wow. I've actually been really struck by how much both Congress and the executive branch have been doing. Um, you know, we've had multiple congressional hearings. I haven't been, like, thrilled with the quality of them, but they're, they're happening Chuck Schumer, uh, just before we started recording, was out there saying that Congress needs to be doing more on this. This is clearly an area of concern for the White House. There's, I can't think of what it's called, but there's there's some kind of like AI advisory committee. Um, uh, they do have the blueprint for an AI Bill of Rights. Like that is, you can look at that and say, well, where is the regulation? But when when was it that ChatGPT like burst onto the scene? It was in November. So it hasn't been very long. And I think if you compare the amount of interest and engagement to sort of aughts, mid-aughts, engagement or lack thereof with a lot of the issues that have contributed to sort of unhealthy internet right now, it, there's a really significant difference. So I'm not saying it's like going to produce regulation that we'd all necessarily be happy about. But it does strike me that there's a clear acknowledgement that this is happening and that the government needs to play some kind of a role. I don't know. Am I being too sunny? Look, I, I, I don't know. I mean, I, I, I think it depends on whether you think that government can meaningfully bend the course of an industry like this in the absence of 
hard law, right? In the absence of sort of command regulation, the the the, the jury, I think, is is still out, and I'm sure there's a lot that the government can do just by getting on its soapbox and saying, you know, here's what we think that AI companies should do, and and then maybe you can shame some AI companies in, into doing it, but. I'm just skeptical that I'm skeptical that any number of congressional hearings or white papers or non-binding bills of rights or you know whatever is going to immediately change the direction of this race between tech juggernauts to capture, I don't know, the next ten trillion dollars in in value. So let me actually come to you on this, Paul, because I you know, you wrote a book uh, in the last, or released a book in the last year, I think you probably took you a little longer than that to write it, that considers the evolution of the knowledge economy, the emergence of new technologies, the way they've proliferated around the international system, and ties a lot of those economic and technological developments over the past century, really, over the 20th century, particularly the latter half thereof, to elements of global instability, different political trends. Um, that contribute to some of the ills and challenges that we're facing in the national system today. How does AI fit into that, if it, if it does? It, it may not uh, from your perspective, but should that help that international experience, that perspective on you know, technological and economic developments over the 20th century and 21st century inform the trajectory we think regulation should take and, frankly, the way it should operate, both at the domestic and potentially international level? Um, what lessons do you pull from that? That might be applicable here. So let me first make a rather cranky point, which is I don't like the term AI and how it frames things, because I think it's a straight from Hollywood concept. And it tends, like the Hollywood movies, to invoke a concern, which is an independent alive. You know, it's the Frankenstein's monster concept. Uh, I'd much prefer it new developments in informational processing and how it expands human capacities for both good and bad. But you can't put that on a coffee mug, Paul. That's like 12 words. you got to hyphenate that at least. Yeah, yeah. So it, it's not AI. It's just more information processing. And, and by thinking that it's going to come alive, uh, it distracts us from what we should be worried about, which is increased capacity for malign actors to do bad things. That it's, uh, long before the singularity, bad guys are going to be using enhanced uh, information processes to mislead and confuse uh, more convincingly than they can do now. So, and and for those things, we already have legal tools. I mean, we already have ways of fighting fraud and non-disclosure, and 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 I think what we need to be thinking about is how using our conventional legal tools to apply to. Uh, these new expressions of old problems, uh, how it plays out internationally. Uh, I, I, I think that the idea of, of uh, top-down international consensus is a form of regulation. There are many reasons to believe that's not going to work. And uh, the voices we hear, including from Congress, is sort of, why don't we adopt the European model? The European model, meaning uh, just cover your eyes, cover your ears, cover your mouth, and and try not to have it and do everything you can to obstruct any new technology because you know your companies aren't in that game. Uh, so what, what I, I think we need to do is to identify with our close peers, even though our peers are also adversaries, and specifically China, to identify areas where we find misuses of advanced information processing uh, something that it's worth having common standards about suppressing, uh, that that it's worth more to us to suppress them than it is to exploit them against each other. And, and, and I don't think that can be memorialized through treaties, and I don't think you can create a formal international institution to do that. But I think you can have conversations and confidence-building practices that can deal, uh, take ransomware, you know, North Korea and, and, and a part of, of Russia, you know, depend heavily on uh, advanced information processes to, for wealth transfer purposes. I think both the U.S. and China probably think it's a bad idea and we can cooperate on suppressing that kind of behavior. That is my general concept for how to approach these things. But I would forget about the singularity. I would forget about all these people losing jobs. I, I think there are more immediate problems having to do with the capacity of malign actors 
to use these tools. So I, I, I guess my question for you, Paul, is why you think it's uh, an either or. I mean, there, there's a big debate. I mean, I think what you just said is an example of, of a, a big debate that's currently happening in the AI tech policy space between you know, those folks that think that you know, there, there, is, there are these existential threats or uh, even if not existential, you know, pretty big threats in the 10 to 15 to 20 year time horizon to just the basics of how society operates. And other folks who think that you know, whether those threats exist or not, um, it's, it's actually not worth thinking about them too much right now. And in fact, the more you think about them, the more it detracts and distracts from the immediate issues, whatever they may be. And, and I, I guess my, my sense, or my, my in, intuition has always been like, we can walk and chew gum at the same time. I mean, you know, if you have something that has profound long-term consequences and profound short-term consequences, just devote more resources to it. I mean, is it, I guess, why are you worried that we have to choose between one of those two things? So Alan, what I'm worried about is those $10 trillion of nuke added value that you're talking about. I mean, if you focus on that and the interest that people have in seizing their share of that, then the question becomes, to what extent are are people who are in the game to get a chunk of that $10 trillion able to shape debates about regulation in a way that hinders their competitors and whether that dynamic will get in the way of a benign, well-considered, well-reflective, multi purpose, pluralist approach to these problems. I mean, there's nothing wrong with pluralism in principle. Uh, and of course, we should keep an eye out for these big problems. But uh, in an environment where people have very profound economic incentives to trip us up, uh, I, I think we have to be very careful. And uh, this is very old school of me. I'm, I'm an old guy. What can I say? But I think Looking at how the new technologies can exploit old problems is a good place to start. As we do that, we can learn more about not just uh, new technologies, but new problems. And we might identify new problems. But I start with don't sleep on the old problems. Yeah, I, I would just totally agree, Paul. And I mean, I vamping on that a little bit. There's a reason that when Sam Altman goes before Congress, he talks about existential risk instead of, for example, the problem of using AI to generate non-consensual pornography of private individuals. I, I think he, uh, but I don't think that's true. I think he talks about both. I mean, I don't know if he specifically talked about that issue, but he, he talks about, I, I think he's actually very clear about talking about both things. Now, maybe there are other people. Of all, all the headlines, all the attention goes to the existential risk issue. I mean, it is existential. Well, <laughs> I think there is a. I think there is an issue here. I also think there is like a a uh, media coverage aspect of this that also feeds into the cycle because those are the issues that grab headlines, that get public attention, that are that get clicks, and therefore they're the ones that get plucked out. You know, uh, I, I know on the you know in terms of what you actually see in terms of legislative activity, which there isn't much yet, but there's a lot of like talk about what specifically can be discussed. There is more of a focus on lower hanging issues, in part because there's the only thing you can really approach because they're the only real problems yet. Uh, everything else is kind of hypothetical at this point. I'll just throw in my usual caveat to all of this, which is to say, which I still stand by. I think this is this is my my old man moment, Paul. I'll take it. Is that we forget what happens every time we get these new technologies, which is that people make a lot of money off of them, and then they they hurt a lot of people on the way, and all of a sudden they become very vulnerable and tempting targets for plaintiffs' attorneys. And I think AI's moment is still coming. Uh, we've actually seen some reports of lawsuits in the uh, percolating um, around different types of activities by AI companies. And as soon as that happens, that big payout that they are getting uh, for the development of this industry is going to start looking uh, a lot tighter and a lot juicier for outside people. And if they're going to want to be able to keep doing this and avoiding some of that litigation risk, they're going to have to figure out ways to cabin their legal exposure. So this is going to be a debate that's going to get a lot more granular, I kind of think, in the next year or two, because the profile these are getting, the way these systems are being rolled out so rapidly, like, you know, we've had three people who have colorable legal claims published in lawfare already, <laughs> uh, let alone out there in the broader universe uh, of people. Um, and the way companies are using these systems are reckless 
in ways that are not intended and are expressly disavowed by the companies developing them. But when you have lawyers using them to do the legal research for them and companies using them to, uh, you know, generate uh, automatic responses like those companies are going to face liability and they're going to try and share the, and spread the blame. So long story short, I think we're going to find out which problems are going to become real very quickly um, in our very litigious society. And that is a virtue of our litigious society, even though it may cause and does cause lots of problems in lots of other places. Common law, adversarial litigation has its has its virtues. And, and I think this is one spot where it actually might prove that they might prove useful. You know, speaking for legal academia for a sec- second, the best article on this general topic is Frank Easterbrook's The Law of the Horse. And I think everyone should read that. You know, Frank's basic point is law solves a lot of problems. And when new ones come around, we still look at how law works and not on the fact that, you know, there's a train now instead of a horse. We don't uh, replace the law of the horse with the law of the train. Paul, Paul that's a, I, I have to say the uh, uh, that's a that's a pretty spicy take bringing back the, the law of the horse. I, I feel like that may be the single most polarizing article in in uh, among uh, legal academics who uh, think about law and, law and tech issues. I, I've never heard of an article get more love and also more abuse than than that one. Right on. I, I think I think Easterbrook would appreciate that. I think he'd like that actually. I have a longstanding theory that like one of the best data points that we have for like legal models for thinking about how to regulate AI is actually how we used to regulate domesticated animals. Because if you think about it, that's kind of what it is. It's a black box where you have certain inputs, but they're not 100% reliable. So, like, where does liability accrue and to what extent it doesn't? It, it's actually, like, a really fascinating parallel. But, you know, I'll save that for a it's blog very post in the future. very philosophical. Philosophical. But it's real. And there's, it's a great way to bring in all these great cases that you read your first year of law school about wild animal attacks in the 19th century. And finally, you know, put them to good use, hopefully. Animals have souls. Does AI <laughs> have a soul? Call Descartes. Do you have a soul? Uh, do I have a soul? I definitely don't have a soul after my kid doesn't sleep for a night. I'm soulless. <laughs> well, folks, I think we are running out of time for today. So that brings us to the end of this week's episode. But this would not be rational security if we did not leave you with some object lessons to ponder over in the week to come. Alan, what do you have for us this week in terms of object lesson? So I have, I and my, my wife and I have been really enjoying this new television show on uh, Apple TV called Platonic. It uh, stars uh, Rose Byrne and Seth Rogen as uh, you know, two good friends that lose touch for a few years and then reacquaint themselves and become really good friends again and sort of all the hijinks they get into. And it's really fun. It's really easy watching. And I also, I just, I really appreciate portrayals of platonic friendships between men and women on television and film where like it's not building up to some like weird romantic thing. It's just like a nice story about friends. I think that is like a very healthy portrayal because I think there are many such friendships in the real world. And it's, it's nice to sort of see them played up uh, and just in like a really delightful, very entertaining comedy. So highly recommend it. I feel like Rose Byrne has become like the most unlikely member of the frat pack, which is very, which I think is what people used to call this group of comedy actors that are all she's hovering so around, good. like hovering around Judd she, uh, she's, Apatow. Yeah, she's 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 so good. I I think I think it, it's just so unexpected. She like does not like if you looked at her, you would not think like that is a comedic actor. But she is really into it. She's like a wonderful sport. Um, she plays up the fact that she doesn't seem obviously like she would be a comic actor it's very the whole thing is extraordinarily charming excellent well excellent recommendation quinta what do you have for us this week i would like to recommend a movie reality on hbo it is a super interesting film that is based on a stage play uh, that is entirely lifted from the transcript of the fbi interview of reality winner, the woman who leaked an intelligence report on uh, Russian efforts to access U.S. voting systems in 2017, leaked it to The Intercept, was swiftly uh, arrested thanks to some very poor techniques on The Intercept's part and eventually got, I believe, four or five years in prison uh, for her trouble. Um, so the the stage play, which is now a uh, film, is essentially the, all the dialogue is just from the transcript. It's kind of a staging of the interview transcript. Um, it's a super, super interesting conceit, and I think it could have 
not worked and instead it works really, really well. I will say from a professional perspective, I found it super interesting to kind of watch how an FBI interview takes place or how it is interpreted by the the filmmaker um, in terms of how the agents sort of try to establish a rapport or how the actors interpret the agents attempting to establish a rapport in the in the transcript and how they sort of move toward getting winner to talk. I will also say the whole time I was just screaming in my head, oh my God, get a lawyer, ask to see the warrant, don't give them your cell phone, what are you doing? Um, but highly, highly recommended. The acting is really great and subtle and I think it has some interesting things to say about the unreality, so to speak, of the moment that we're living in. This reminds me, I'm very, I'm very curious and I'm actually very excited to watch this. I'm sure I'll watch it this weekend because it's up my alley. I saw a really, really entertaining play at, I forget, whatever that theater is on 14th Street here in D.C. that was, uh, no, it was Woolly Mammoth Theater that I think is still open here in D.C. where they, it was just the transcript of oral arguments for one Supreme Court case. And I can't remember <laughs> the name of the case. It's not the I know it when I see it case, but it's a case about, if I recall correctly, I think like erotic, erotic dancers Making oh a First yeah, Amendment I know. Claim. I know the one that you're. It has to do with uh, right the the degree to which they had to be covered up, yes, or whether exactly. whether they're not being covered <sighs> up was a First Amendment protected expression. It was such an entertaining play because they just they just read the oral argument verbatim with a little bit of editing, but was done with like crazy stage play and involved one actor running completely naked around stage as he like recited the like the apex of his <laughs> argument. And I was like, this is this is fascinating. I, I I think that if we finally get cameras in the courtroom, we should also there should be some nudity involved. If you're gonna you gotta, you gotta commit to the bit. Go all the way. Well I don't know about I'm not gonna I'm gonna co-sign that, but okay. <laughs> you guys are no fun. Um well, for my object lesson, I will depart from uh, video media and go to audio media. Um, I have been really enjoying dipping into a trio of related albums uh, that I'm going to recommend to people because um, they kind of popped back up on radar. The first one is an album, actually the last album by Gil Scott Heron, uh, a kind of well-known, people might have heard of him, uh, phenomenally interesting actually like novelist, visual artist, uh, but most notably kind of spoken word poet uh, and musician from the late 60s into the 70s and, and afterwards. Um, very influential in hip hop, very influential in a lot of different types of musical mediums, but developed a very bad drug problem, faced a lot of criminal problems uh, uh, and then died in 2011. But he released this last album called I'm New Here, which is a very sparse, lo-fi, really almost borderline spoken word uh, album, although it has little elements of like uh, musical elements, certain like kind of hip hop, trip hop kind of elements pulled into it. But then that album was remixed by Jamie XX, a talented uh, British uh, DJ into a DJ and musician into like a, a EDM album. Uh, that's really interesting. I had not heard before just a couple weeks ago, but I was going to a Jamie XX concert uh, and listened to it. And it's a really phenomenal, interesting reimagining of this album. And then more recently, just in the last few years, Makai McRaven, who is an amazing jazz per- jazz percussionist, does a lot of work with R&B artists, hip hop artists, uh, and has released a lot of really fascinating, great albums of his own, did another reimagining of this album called We Are New Again that uh, completely restructures Gil Scott Heron's original album. Uh, I, I think actually it's my favorite of the three in a lot of ways because um, I think it does a lot to kind of lean into the vibe and original energy and motive of the original album and but uses Gil Scott Heron's uh, vocals in a really fascinating set of rearrangements. That is just great. I love everything Makai McRaven does, but I think this is uh, some of the, the favorite thing of his that I've, I've listened to. So I encourage folks to check out those three albums. They make a great listen kind of together uh, as I've been doing the last couple of weeks. And I'll, I'll pass that along as my recommendation. Paul, what do you have for us as our special guest this week? Well, first, uh, a quick response, uh, Scott. I mean, Lou Reed claimed that he was the original rapper, but unquestionably it was Gil Scott Heron. Uh, I think talent. most people would maintain that one. Give, one give, of those give people a who goes dude. back to the 60s, and I think that's a <laughs> transcendent talent. So what I have just started reading today, it discovered that the latest uh, John Banville uh, writing in, uh, Dr. Kirk series has just dropped for people who don't know John Banville, or they, or they don't know that he also writes as Benjamin Black. Uh, the Benjamin Black books are nominally police procedurals, but they're really about the dark heart and soul of Ireland in the 50s and, and 60s uh, from the point of view of an Irishman who is, I think, one of the 
greatest prose masters writing in English right now. And, and to have yet another of these books available is, is just a delight. It's called Lock Up and go and get it. Wonderful. Well, a wonderful recommendation. We, uh, we have we have film, we have TV, we have books, we have all your we mediums. Have folks. Audio. No recipes this week, but I think we gave like ten of them the last couple of weeks. So check check in for your food needs and your other needs. But until then, that brings us to the end of this week's episode. Rational Security is, of course, a production of Lawfare. So be sure to visit our homepage at lawfareblog.com for links to past episodes, for our written work, for the, our notes from our episodes, and for the written work of other Lawfare contributors, and for information on Lawfare's other phenomenal podcast series. And be sure to follow us on Twitter at RATL Security, and be sure to leave a rating or review wherever you might be listening. And don't forget to sign up to become a material supporter of Lawfare on Patreon at patreon.com slash lawfare for an ad-free version of this podcast and other special benefits. Our audio engineer and producer this week was Noam Osband of Goat Rodeo, and our music, as always, was performed by Sophia Yan. And we are once again edited by the wonderful Jen Patcha Howell. On behalf of my co-host Alan Quinta and our special guest Paul Stephen, I am Scott R. Anderson, and we will talk to you next week. Until then, goodbye. <laughs>